Hello gentlemen, this is C.S. MGTOW. Today I'm going to be talking about a very, very important race that should be taking place. And that is the race to secure the long-term future of our species by getting off this planet, developing free unlimited energy, for example, or an artificial womb, which ought to be, in my opinion, the goal of any thinking species such as the human ape. What we have instead is another race. And that race has been taking place for millennia. That is the reproductive race. The race to eat, fuck, and reproduce. The race to satisfy the ever-increasing hypergamy found in the human female. The focus of this video is what I like to call the New Malthusian Trap. What is very important to note is that we're constantly told, as a society, that we're currently living in a golden age of technological, medical, scientific, and social progress. I mean, look at the computers around us. Look at our iPhones. 20 years ago, the internet was a creaky machine for geeks. Now, we couldn't imagine life without it. We always, as a society, seems to be on the verge of medical breakthroughs that would have seemed like magic only a hundred years ago. Cloned organs, stem cell therapies to repair our very DNA. However, the notion that our 21st century world is one of accelerating advances is so dominant that it seems almost crazy to challenge it. I mean, every week, if you pick up just the average newspaper, you'll read about new hopes for cancer sufferers, developments in the lab that might one day lead to cures, there's always talk about a new era of space tourism and super jets that maybe has to fly us around the world in a few hours. Yet stop for a second. This vision of unparalleled innovation up to now has been just hype, speculation, and fantasy. Yet there actually was once an age where speculation matched reality. It came to a halt about 40 years ago, and most of what has happened since then has merely been an incremental improvement on what came before, and, and that actually was the true age of innovation. So let's call that age the golden quarter, as it were, because it ran from about 1945 to 1971, and just about everything that defines the modern world either came about or had its seeds sown during that time, the pill, electronics, computers, the, you know, the internet, nuclear power, television, antibiotics, space travel, even civil rights, you know, mass aviation, cheap, reliable, safe automobiles, high-speed trains. During that time, humanity put a man on the moon, we sent a probe to Mars, we beat smallpox, and we discovered the double spiral key of life. This golden quarter was a unique period of less than a single human generation, a time when innovation appeared to be running on, you know, speed. Today, however, progress is defined almost entirely by consumer-driven, often banal improvements in information technology. So the US economist Tyler Cohen, in his essay, The Great Stagnation in 2011, and I'll be linking to that article as all of the other references used in this video will be in the description bar. So Tyler argued that in the US, at least, or in the Western world, a technological plateau has been reached. Sure, our iPhones are great and they're very, very shiny. However, it's not on the same level as humanity designing, you know, a vehicle that could get us across the Atlantic in eight hours or eliminating smallpox. And as the US technologist Peter Thiel once put it, we wanted flying cars. Instead, we got 140 characters. And of course, he was referring to Twitter, which I personally don't see Twitter as any form of human progress whatsoever. During this golden quarter, we saw and benefited from the biggest advances in science and technology. And if you were, let's say, a biologist or a physicist or a material scientist, there really was no better time to be working. Take a look around for a few minutes. Look at the aircraft in the sky. 
What you're basically seeing is an updated version of the one that was flying in the 1960s. In 1971, a regular airliner took about eight hours to fly from London to New York, and it still does. In 1971, there was one airliner that could do the trip in three hours, which was Concorde, and Concorde is now dead. Our cars are a little faster, they're safer, they use a little bit less fuel than they did in 1971, but there has been no paradigm shift. So for sure we are living longer, but this has had disappointingly little to do with any medical breakthroughs. So since 1970, the US federal government has spent more than $100 billion on what Richard Nixon at the time described as the war on cancer. Far more has been spent globally, of course, with most wealthy nations boasting a well-funded cancer research body. And, and they literally throw money at this disease. Despite the billions of investments, the war on cancer has been a pretty spectacular failure in the United States. The death rates for all forms of cancer have dropped by only about 5% in the period of 1950 to 2005, according to the National Center for Health Statistics. And again, the link is in the description bar. So even if you strip out the co-founding variables such as age um, and better diagnosis, the blunt fact is that with most kinds of cancer, your chances in 2014 are actually not much better than in 1974. And in many cases, your treatment will be pretty much the same, but particularly in the very, very early settings uh, of cancer. So after all of the dizzying breakthroughs of the 20th century. Physics has, as a field, just kind of ground to a halt. And most of the recent advances in longevity that we experience as human beings have come about by very, very simple expedient, uh, you know, behavior. For example, getting people to give up smoking, you know, persuading people to eat better, you know, get, getting you know, individuals who are a little bit older to take, you know, blood pressure medication. So the big question which I have asked myself is why has progress stopped? One kind of school of thought is that advocated by Tyler Cohen, the US economist I mentioned earlier, and he argued that progress has ground to a halt because the low-hanging fruit has been plucked. And these fruits include the cultivation of unused land, you know, mass education, and the capitalization of, of technologies that resulted in the scientific breakthroughs that were made in the 19th century. It is possible that the advances we saw in the period of 1945 to 1970 were quick wins. You know, that, that is a possibility, and further progress is much harder. So going from, let's say, a prop airline of the 1930s you know, to the jets of the 1960s is perhaps easier than going from today's airlines to something much better. But history does suggest that this school of thought doesn't give us, a, you know, a thorough explanation of why technological progress for the human ape has ground to a halt. Another thing which came to my mind is, you know, could it be money? You know, could, could that be why we seem to, instead of developing flying cars, as, uh, you know, the uh, technologist said, we are developing, you know, uh, and spending innovation on 140 characters, and and I guess this is going to be partly the focus of this video. What we do with our money, in my opinion, has directly affected the development of our species. I also decided to make this video because I'm not particularly optimistic about the future of our species. I'm hopeful, of course, but I'm not very optimistic. I see very, very little in the way that we currently behave to suggest that we have a long-term future. Firstly, we're certainly overdue, or at least the planet is overdue, some form of extinction level event, which according to experts happens around every 25 to 30 million years. And any random number of, you know, extinction, you know, level events may wipe us all out, or at the very, very least wipe out most of life on Earth, including, or especially humans, since we, you know, we're, Humans are primarily a tropical species. You know, we don't tend to do very well in the extreme cold. So we depend very, very heavily on the rest of the ecosystem, including plants and animals, for our very, very survival. So if, if something takes them out, we follow very, very quickly. 
you know, let's say, for example, an asteroid of about five kilometers in size and diameter, you know, impacts with Earth, that, that will cause absolutely devastating global damage. And if, let's say, an asteroid doubles that size of, let's say, 10 kilometers, hits the Earth, we're looking at an extinction level event like the one that caused the end of the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. So absolutely, we are overdue, you know, a, a catastrophic solar superstorm, which would simply rip apart the protective magnetic field surrounding the Earth and, and likely send the Earth back into a technological dark age, perhaps one that we might not recover from. Most species do not survive extinction level events. For example, the Permian uh, Trisiac extinction event that only left 4% of the species alive. And just think about that for a second. All of the living things today are descendants of the 4% of species that survived that particular extinction level event. So our ability to survive the next extinction level event may be entirely dependent on our ability as a species to get the hell off the earth and establish viable, self-sustaining colonies on other planets and our solar systems, or perhaps even further afield. The Malthusian trap is a theory that as population growth is ahead of agricultural growth, there must be a stage at which food supply is inadequate for feeding the population. And about 200 years ago, the Reverend Thomas Malthus wrote in his essay on, on the principle of population that if mankind's blind biological urges were left unchecked, population would increase in a geometrical ratio and quickly exhaust the finite resources of nature. And then he went on to say that the power of population is infinitely greater than the power of the earth to produce sustenance for man. But because land could be made more productive because of intensive cultivation, humanity managed to avoid widespread famine. And of course, the Malthusian notion is intuitively appealing. We do have a finite landmass, and much of this landmass is completely unsuitable for agriculture or even housing. So if nothing changes and we, and we continue to re use resources as we do, then one, one day, of course, we will simply, quote-unquote, run out of food. So humanity avoided the original Malthusian trap as humans are not content with our current state of knowledge which is a great thing. That point was eventually realized by Malthus uh, himself, and his later work noted that under the right circumstances and with an appropriate institutional structures, impending scarcity could stimulate a creative response to mitigate or curtail resource depletion. So, of course, world farmers had not feast a vastly increased population over the last 50 years, by devoting substantially more land or labor to ag agriculture, increasing food supplies reflect improved crop yields per hectare of arable land. You know, the farmers, the scientists, the agronomists, and a host of other academics working with government researchers and private corporations and individuals farms. These individuals greatly improved the world's knowledge of how to breed better crops and animals, how to produce and use, you know, herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers. And when we look back at the 1950s, the, the, the world average grain yield was about 1.1 tons per hectare. And by 1992, it had risen to 2.8 tons per hectare. Before proceeding with the crux of my argument, I'd like to give you a little bit more background by taking a look at discretionary spending habits. This is how much we as a society spend on non-essentials, specifically in the Western world, where, of course, most of the discretionary income per capita, and, and in absolute terms, is available. So my source for this is the Wall Street Journal. They published an article titled, How Much Americans Spend Annually on Goods and Services They Don't Absolutely Need. The link is in the description bar. It was published on the 3rd of April, 2011. And the article states that the number is $1.2 trillion. That's how much Americans spend annually on goods and services they don't absolutely need. Given that the GDP that year in 2011 was 15.2 trillion, that's around 8% of GDP. So the authors then went on to say that this Easter weekend, Americans will spend a lot of money on items such as marshmallow peeps, plush bunnies, I have no idea what that is, 
fake hay, begging a question. How much does the US economy depend on the purchase of goods and services that people don't absolutely need, as it turns out quite a lot, on non-essential stuff, including pleasure boats, jewelry, booze, gambling, and candy? What is important here is to notice the trend. 11% of total consumer spending is classed as non-essential. That's up from 9.3% a decade earlier and up from 4% in 1959. And of course, these numbers are adjusted for inflation. So since 1959, the amount that we spent on non-essentials has almost tripled. And please do keep that date in mind, that 1959. It's going to become important for the argument that I'm making a little bit later on because it's pretty essential to understand what's happening here. So the date range of, let's say, the late 1950s to the early 1960s. And to be sure, different people have different ideas of what's considered essential. To a wealthy man, a Lamborghini may be considered essential. So I'm not making a value judgment here. What I want to do is to analyze a phenomenon. And, and I would just add that that estimate of 1.2 trillion is probably a little too low because it doesn't account for the added cost of certain items, such as, let's say, flashy cars or a big house. But the sheer volume of non-essential spending offers, you know, food for thought in a variety of different directions. I mean, firstly, uh, I guess one could be an optimist and see this as the evidence of triumph of, you know, modern capitalism in raising living standards so that we enjoy so much leisure and consume so much extra stuff that even in a deep recession, uh, you know, we wouldn't have to cut into the, you know, into, into the basics or whatever. Alternatively, it could be a sign that the US economy depends too heavily on stimulating, for, you know, demand for stuff that people actually don't really need to the detriment of public goods, such as research, health and education. And of course, the article or that figure of 8% of GDP or $1.2 trillion, you know, won't give you the full story because even what might be considered to be essential spending uh, categories, people tend to use much more than they strictly need for their well-being and survival in absolute terms. For example, a couple with a couple of kids may choose to have a four-bedroom house when in times gone by, younger children may have just simply shared a bedroom so they would need a three-bedroom house. Or, as I've seen very, very commonly these days, families will have multiple motor vehicles suited for different purposes. So there'll be an SUV you know, just for the school run because it makes you know, the woman feel safer. There'll be a small car for you know, doing shopping because it's easier to park with. And we haven't, of course, counted in things such as social welfare, but that's probably you know, a little bit beyond the scope of this video. And just to continue with this background, I want us to review consumer spending habits in 2015. And it's debatable, of course, whether, it, you know, let's say the UK is still in recession or, we've, you know, if we've come out of a recession. And I came across this very, very interesting article titled America is back to pre-recession spending habits of save less and spend more. And it was published on the 3rd of June, 2015 on the research site Mintel. So I'm basically going to read directly from the article. Thanks to increasing wages, the lowest jobless rate since 2008 and increased consumer confidence, Americans feel more comfortable accruing debt and have reverted back to pre-recession spending habits. And that's according to the Mintel flagship report titled American Lifestyles 2015. And they looked comprehensively at American consumer markets and they predicted that over the next five years, total sales are forecast to increase by 21.9%. Non-essential categories, including vacations and dining out, are expected to see the greatest gains with projected five-year increases of about 27% each. Improving personal finances, shifting demographics, and consumers balancing spending priorities by trading up or down rather than cutting entirely or splurging across the board will drive these increases. And the report then went on to say that U.S. consumer expenditure increased 3.4% in 2014, with spending in recreational categories, including vacations and tourism, as well as technology and communication, showing the greatest gains. Consumer sentiment supports these gains, as 61% of U.S. consumers believe they are spending about the same or more on vacations in 2015, versus 43% who believe this in 2014. The vacation and tourism market is, of course, supported by relatively wealthy baby boomers. And I'm still reading from the article here. 
and they are taking more vacations as they retire from the workforce, as well as millennials who are increasingly spending more in this category. In fact, apparently a full 30% of international travelers are millennials despite many staple electronic uh, categories struggling to maintain sales, overall spending in technology and communications has trended upward since 2009. That trend is expected to continue through 2019 with a 26% increase driven by smartphones, trends in wearable devices, and advanced media technology to support 4K resolution, which may strengthen TV sales. While consumer sentiment and Americans' confidence in their own financial situation has trended up for the past seven years, people are less confident in the U.S. economy overall, despite the U.S. economy reaching unprecedented heights. In March 2015, the current bull market hit a six-year height, gaining more than 200% since it bottomed out in March 2009. At present, it is the third longest uh, bull market in history. While much of Europe continues to struggle, the U.S. economy is growing. In line with economic growth is increased consumer confidence. As January 2015 was the first time that confidence eclipsed the pre-recession high, household spending expectations appear to have stabilized post-recession, with nearly one in five consumers planning on spending more month over month. These factors point to increased spending in 2015, which Mintel forecasts will increase by 3.9%. So... Thank you for sitting through all of that background. It was very, very tedious, I'm sure. So the two questions that I believe we should ask are as follows. The first question is, what made the golden era that ran from 1945 to 1971 so productive in terms of science and technology? And the second question is, why did it come to a stop in 1971? My hypothesis is that the focus of human beings changed. And as I mentioned, that kind of you know, period of the you know, late 1950s to the early 1960s gives us a bit of a clue here. A watershed event, at least I consider it a watershed event within the context of this video, took place around the 19, you know, very, very early 1960s. And it had been violently campaigned for by women, and that was the passage of the Equal Pay Act. And of course, yeah, look, this act on its own certainly did not account for the massive triple-fold increases in non-essential spending seen across the Western world. However, it codified into law a societal change that would, within the space of a decade, see more than 60% of women within the labor market. Uh, and again, this single event, that is the Equal Pay Act, can only serve as a marker of both societal sentiment and technological change. And what I mean by that is this. Prior to that time period, the labor market favored male participation almost exclusively. It could scarcely accommodate both genders. Around the late 50s and early 60s, humans built up a technological base of, and by humans, of course, I mean men, that made it possible for women to enter the labor market. This then caused women to push for legal change that would help codify equal pay into law. And again, I'm not against the Equal Pay Act. I couldn't care less. The legal change that, that was represented by the Equal Pay Act and all of the laws that subsequently followed were symptoms. No fault divorce was then signed into law by the governor of California, you know, Ronald Reagan in the 1960s. And again, we see no-fault divorce was a symptom of the fact that women were earning their own money. Since they no longer needed men as providers, there was scarcely any reason to remain married unless the marriage absolutely gratified their every woman wish. And my hypothesis is that during this period of time, this kind of watershed period, that's where the brakes on hypergamy were lifted. And in his video, uh, you know, Powered by Orgasm, the excellent, you know, series by Barbarossa, Barbarossa explored the consequences of positive male competition. You know, let's say two physicists going at it, or two mathematicians, or two biochemists going at it. Their competition benefits us all. Technology lifted the brakes on hypergamy, and as a result, men 
shifted from passive competition for female access to a far more active form of sexual competition. No longer could a man simply find a woman for reproduction after a short courtship ritual and get on with the more important task of organizing and building an advanced industrial civilization. No longer could government help through tax monies to develop the next generation of industrial materials, internal engines, or spaceflight. Now the elected leadership became focused on the ever-increasing needs of the female voting bloc and the individual man found that overnight, to avoid losing out on the most important genetic game, you know, the desire to reproduce, he was now in a permanent marathon against other males. A marathon that would divert all of his energies into, for all intents and purposes, keeping her happy. He could never relax even for a second. He had to keep producing, to keep making more money, to buy shinier and shinier objects. Since her desires were ever increasing, he was competing against other males and the government in this respect. And my hypothesis continued is that this shifted the productive energies of Western civilization, which during the golden era was certainly responsible for the lion's share of innovation. So one of the questions I have pondered in scripting this video is to what extent can humans ever be truly productive again as a species if women have economic and political autonomy? Will our desire to compete for the golden uterus cause us to develop at a snail's pace and go extinct within a few millennia. So that's why I call it the new Malthusian trap. It's a phenomenon that has two parts. Firstly, a very, very large proportion of any productivity gains made by humans now goes directly into acquiring non-essential goods that aid men in the dominance hierarchy for female validation through conspicuous spending. Secondly, as such a large and easily accessible part of the economy responds to the manufacture of nice looking, but ultimately worthless items such as new, you know, a new iPhone 6, you know, with a slightly better camera than the iPhone 5, or a new iWatch, for example. Therefore, new research spending and scientific ingenuity is geared towards the relentless development and production of products with real worth. So we are, as a species, squandering scientific and technological ingenuity. Will this be the story of our species? Even if by some miracle we do manage to escape, and I use the term escape Earth, will we mine helium-3 on the moon just so that we can build bigger, McMansions back on Earth to attract women with a slightly more perfect hipped to bust ratio and more flawless skin. You know, as Barbarossa put it, we are powered by orgasm, and as Stardust put it, our mating selection strategies are maladaptive for modernity. As a species, we are still at this late stage, this late in the game so geared towards exchanging sex for resources that further innovation may actually not benefit us by solving mankind's most pressing problems of, let's say, energy shortage, climate change, avoidance of extinction due to an asteroid impact, for example, or the development of asexual reproduction. Since innovation is primarily diverted into the curious, and nice looking, but ultimately useless. Think of the very, very first iPod you held and how lovingly you must have held it in your hands as you scan through the music and listen to you know, that beautiful crystal clear sound quality. That same iPod is probably now resting in a landfill somewhere. As a species, we spend like there is no tomorrow. That is, we discount the future very, very heavily as a result of the fact that we're powered by orgasm and our mate selection preferences have become maladaptive. As a species, we behave in the manner of a man who upon meeting the first woman who ever pays him any attention, you know, he pawns his watch, he goes into debt to keep up the image of perfection in her eyes, you know, he buys a nicer car, he moves into a flashier part of town, he starts wearing designer clothing, all in the hopes of keeping her legs open for him and not other men. On the individual level, we would recognize this as irrationality of the higher sort. Now, this man in question places 
too little emphasis on his future well-being versus his present-day sexual gratification and standing in the social dominance hierarchy. When we do this as a species, however, the net result is that all of the collective ingenuity of human science builds a car that goes a little bit faster, or headphones that sound a little bit better, you know, with a deeper bass, or beer that stays cooler for longer in the can, or women's clothing that doesn't crease when it's left on a heap on the floor. And remember that in 2011, 1.2 trillion was spent on non-essential items, jewelry, makeup, handbags, Think of the opportunity cost, not just of the 1.2 trillion, but the engineers who, who now, of course, have to you know, manufacture this useless garbage, the scientists, the chemists, the academics, whose careers are diverted to work for Apple, Gucci, or Prada versus NASA, for example. These are the outcomes due to the voting preferences we make when we spend our money. And I'm not criticizing here. I don't have a desire to be prescriptive just an observation that I find illuminating, humans would rather, as a whole, meet the demands of maladaptive hypergamy by making shiny smartphones than investing in cold fusion or zero-point energy. In my opinion, and, and this is just my opinion, so strong is the human sex drive and so potentially deleterious to the long-term well-being of our species is our powered-by-orgasm method of civilization, a phrase that Barbarossa coined, that unless there is a decoupling between the human male and female, then mankind is unlikely to ever divert enough resources to prevent our probable extinction. Unless we end the foolish notions of romantic love, you know, this mystical love bond between the human male and female, a married man will get a pay rise and simply buy a bigger car or, or you know, get into more debt or on a bigger mortgage instead of taking time to reflect upon and answer the questions that may lead our species to unlimited free energy. The very first Malthusian trap was easily escaped in that it pressed upon the greatest survival need, food. We simply had no other choice as a species to develop, you know, better yielding crops, animals that were more resistant to disease, and crops that could survive a parasite infection. Failing to evolve would have simply wiped us out. The new Malthusian trap may be far harder to avoid as it's based around another survival urge, which is often just as potent, and that's the need to procreate. Humans are driven by this to an incredible degree. And also, this time around, mankind has no such pressures in that, let's say, for example, you know, even if climate change is, let's say, anthropogenic, such is the length of time that it takes for the effects to be felt that we all, all every single one of us listening to this video, will be dead before you know, its effects are, are seen, we won't have to suffer the consequences. The first Malthusian trap, we would suffer hunger if we didn't develop more effective means of agriculture. Now we, we just simply don't have that time pressure. So we don't have a lot of incentive to escape this particular Malthusian trap. And it's somehow, at least to myself, very ironic that the very reproductive drive that helped us populate this planet and rise to the very, very top of the food chain may also ensure that we have no chance of ever leaving this planet. My hopes for MGTOW, one of the reasons I started making videos, is that MGTOW moves away from a movement that simply bitches about women and we, as men going our own way, become you know, the, the spark for the decoupling I mentioned earlier, the final nail in the coffin of the mythical love bond, you know, marriage and tradition that is simply choking the life out of our species. The decoupling of the human male and female may, may be, you know, just what's needed to free up the capital, labor, human ingenuity, and the desire to invest in clean energy, you know, the colonization of Mars, and asexual reproduction. We're now nearing the end of this video. I'm really, really grateful you've stayed with me so far. I would like you to ponder a question. Can the longer term needs of our species compete with the human sex drive? The human courtship ritual, the desire for the human male to placate the ever-growing list of demands the human female places on providing vaginal access, will our focus on sex and the impact of runaway hypergamy doom us as a species or as men to labor 
to buy bigger, you know, homes and more expensive clothing and faster cars to get laid? Will we ever focus on the bigger picture as a species? Will we ever have a common goal of self-sustaining energy, self-sustaining colonies on Jupiter? Or will we just fuck, 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 you know, till, let's say, in 400 years, an asteroid hits the Earth and wipes us out? Or will we just reproduce at such a rate that we have polluted the atmosphere enough to make life uninhabitable for our species? The human sex drive, that very same drive that allowed us to become the apex predator, might also carry within it the seeds of our own destruction. Thank you very, very much. This is C.S. Mictow.